Welcome back, everyone. Another day, another Chinese saying. Laszlo Montgomery with you, as always. If you're looking for a few nice stories behind some of the more popular and not so well-known Chinese sayings, you've come to the right place. And for our Cheng Yu for this time, I'm featuring a saying that was as true back in the Qin Dynasty from whence it came as it is today. In fact, any dictator from any century in world history pretty much owes their very survival to this great Chinese saying. This one is the linchpin on which all dictators, autocrats, tyrants, and authoritarian government leaders owe their power. China History Podcast listeners all know this one. The story behind these four characters are as famous as the saying itself, Zhe Lu Wei Ma. That's right, 207 BC, the final years of the Qin, and we owe this story to none other than El Gran Historiador himself, Sima Qian, and in the chapter entitled Qin Shi Huang Ban Ji, from this most famous of ancient works of Chinese historiography, the Shi Ji, we get this classic, Zhe Lu Wei Ma. From the season six opener, Zhe Sang Ma Huai, point to the mulberry tree and scold the locust tree, you surely recall the character zhe means to point at. And a lu, well, that's a deer. Zhe lu, to point to a deer. Wei, well, this is a character with many uses and definitions, but for our purposes in this episode, it means to act as, or serve as, or to be, or to mean. And the final character, ma, well, that's a horse. Point, deer, as a horse. Not that difficult to figure out, but without already knowing this famous story from 3rd century B.C. China, you really can't know for sure, and you certainly can't appreciate it as much. Top billing in this tale, of course, is none other than the maybe-maybe-not eunuch Zhao Gao, featured not only in the Qin Dynasty episode, but also in the Eunuchs of China series, Part 1. Besides the inspiration behind this great Cheng Yu, Zhao Gao is also remembered as one of the earliest eunuchs, and boy, did he ever give them a bad name. He's one of the more reviled personages from Chinese history. So let's get this show on the road and find out why. No need to rehash the glory years of the Qin Dynasty, nor its illustrious founder, Ying Zheng, who reigned as the first Qin emperor. Let's go straight to the peculiar ending that's a favorite of so many lovers of Chinese history. Whilst traveling out east in between July and August 210 BC, near the Henan-Shandong border, the emperor died. And that immediately set in motion a concatenation of events that resulted, ultimately, in the fall of the dynasty. After defeating the warring states and founding the Qin dynasty, he only reigned as emperor from 221 to 210 BC, barely 11 years. In a nutshell, with the emperor so suddenly and unexpectedly deceased and still very far from the capital, Zhao Gao figured, why not take advantage of the situation to make a power grab? At that moment in the summer of 210 BC, the first emperor's entourage, besides Zhao Gao, included his right-hand man and chancellor Li Si, as well as the emperor's 18th and youngest son, Hu Hai, who was in his late teens. Now, even though he wasn't the crown prince, Zhao Gao came up with a scheme to have the actual crown prince eliminated and then take advantage of the confusion and political chaos to plop Hu Hai on the throne to reign as the second Qin emperor, Qin Arshi. Zhao Gao knew full well that the emperor wanted the crown prince Fu Su to take over after he died, but Fu Su was too close to Zhao Gao's gravest political enemy the Qin emperor's loyal general, Meng Tian. On his deathbed, the emperor had written a letter to Fu Su telling him to immediately return to the capital and be ready to take over as his successor. That letter, of course, was never delivered, and as the famous story goes, as told by Sima Qian himself, Zhao Gao conspired with Li Si to take the emperor's seal, forge a letter to both Meng Tian and Fu Su, commanding them to commit suicide, which, surprisingly, they did. And this left things open for Hu Hai to be named as the next emperor. 
And according to Sima Qian, as the royal entourage made its way back to the capital, Xianyang, in order to cover up the stench of the emperor's rotting corpse, this was in September, Li Su had a carriage of dried fish placed before and after the emperor's carriage. Then two months later, when they got back to Xianyang, present-day Xi'an, the ruse was continued and no one was the wiser. No one knew the emperor had perished. It was a perfectly executed coup d'etat. Then, at the most favorable moment for the conspirators, the emperor's death was finally announced. And Hu Hai, now reigning as Qin Er Shi, before he rode the Qin dynasty over the edge of a cliff, he got to enjoy trying out all these imperial powers. He may have been the Qin emperor's son, but he was no Qin Shi Huang. With this inexperienced, malleable 21-year-old spoiled boy on the throne, Zhao Gao was able to quickly assume political control and manipulate the levers of power. Qin Er Shi was happy just to hang in the palace and sample all his deceased father's perks and let Zhao Gao run the empire. Zhao Gao, while the emperor was busy having fun, began to consolidate his control over the levers of government. Now, any would-be autocrat with two or more brain cells in Zhao Gao's shoes looking to assume dictatorial powers knows you got to suppress all dissenters. Anyone who isn't standing with you is against you. And they got to go. And so we get to the part of the story where this Cheng Yu comes from. One day, Zhao Gao came up with the idea to bring a deer to a meeting with the emperor and all the top palace officials. And he displayed the deer in front of all those assembled and offered it to the emperor as tribute. And before everyone standing before the emperor on that fine day, Zhao Gao regaled the animal's fine merits, calling it a perfect horse specimen. Everyone there knew that wasn't a horse. It was, beyond the shadow of any doubt, some species of deer, a lu. It wasn't even a member of the genus Equus. The officials all started mumbling and looking at each other. They didn't know what to make of this. This animal standing before them was a deer. But this snake, Zhao Gao, he was saying it was a horse. Even the emperor, after first denying the deer was a horse, well, he always went along with anything Zhao Gao said. Zhao Gao asked the officials all standing around, pointing at this hoofed mammal, deer or horse. Some of the officials twigged on what was going on, and they figured if they knew what was good for them, they better hop on that train and call that deer a horse. Furthermore, seeing how some of his officials were concurring with Zhao Gao, the emperor, too, he agreed this was a horse indeed. But some officials, eh, they remained silent or flat out denied this animal was a horse. They insisted it was a deer. Zhao Gao expected this and had prearranged to have any dissenters summarily executed. He didn't want anyone left standing who would resort to challenging him with facts or, heaven forbid, the truth. Every autocrat's worst enemy. So anything that involves deliberate misrepresentation of the facts and the distortion of reality, this is what zhi lu wei ma means. If you're a man on a mission and the truth gets in the way of achieving your ends, you need to do what Zhao Gao did. Zhi lu wei ma. Point to a deer and call it a horse. The rest is simple. All those who agree, that's your base. All those who disagree or call you a liar, <laughs> you can't have that. You got to kill them, imprison them, or just do something to silence them. Today, we call it gaslighting. The act of gaslighting, where misinformation is used to manipulate someone's thinking and sow self-doubt and confusion in their mind with the objective of getting them to question their own judgment and intuition. And just as Zhao Gao did back in the late 3rd century BC, anyone who denies the alternative facts and refuses to call that deer a horse, you have to silence them. Kill them, throw them in a gulag or concentration camp. Do something, because to a tyrant or an autocrat, the greatest enemy by far is the truth. Zhao Gao knew that, and so did all the others in Zhao Gao's shoes over the millennia that followed and into our day. This is a variation to the 
Hans Christian Andersen folktale about the emperor's new clothes. Dictators don't like to be told anything they don't want to hear. Everyone complimented the emperor's new clothes, and no one had the courage to tell him the truth, that he had no clothes on. The possible repercussions for speaking the truth were too deadly and perilous, and people, being people and all, valued their lives. And just in case you're wondering, later on, Hu Hai, the hapless second Qin emperor, well, as soon as he started to have regrets about putting so much faith in Chao Kao, well, he ended up being forced to commit suicide. Even Chao Kao's co-conspirator, Li Si, that giant of legalism, creator of the small seal script, he too had to go one day. Chao Kao had him chopped in half. When the walls finally started tumbling down and the Qin Empire was racked with revolts and uprisings, Zhao Gao put Fu Su's son on the throne, who we remember as Zi Ying. And once this grandson of the mighty Qin Shi Huang became emperor, well, he went and did the right thing and had Zhao Gao killed. And for good measure, he had Zhao Gao's whole family exterminated. Not all tyrants and autocrats ended up this way, though. Most died of old age. Zhi Lu Wei Ma point to a deer and call it a horse. The secret weapon of any authoritarian regime. Works every time. Eh, for a while, anyway. But you don't have to be a dictator to Zhi Lu Wei Ma. This one is free to use on anyone who's taking the truth or facts and purposely misrepresenting them to make their point and suss out who the dissenters are. So, there it is. Let me thank Emma in the UK, working hand-in-hand hand with yours truly, keeping that special relationship alive and well, to bring you this program that seeks to offer you not only a new saying, but the enjoyable stories behind them, all from the annals of Chinese history. So, until the next time, mesdames et messieurs, this is Laszlo Montgomery signing off, as always, from the City of Night, here in the State of Confusion. Do think about coming back next time, won't you? for another amusing and entertaining episode of the Chinese Sayings Podcast.